Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. All right, welcome everybody. Now you're on my channel. We were just on Gutsick Gibbons' channel. We will be on Dr. Dan's channel next time, but today we're here to talk about the waiting time problem, which is, it's, it, it's a, the knockdown debunk of evolution. Once you realize that there's a waiting time problem, that's it for evolution. It's, it's all over, boys. You know, it, it had been a long time since I'd looked into the waiting time problem. And to prepare for this this afternoon, I decided to kind of refresh my memory. And so I started getting into, you know, <laughs> when I watched Dan's videos, I went on, you know, debate evolution was and all the stuff on that. And I was really, really struck by how the waiting time problem is knocked down by such basic concepts that you have to understand in evolution that like babies know. Like mm -hmm. if you paid attention to AP bio and you happen to take AP bio or just a really good regular biology course, you probably know how some of this stuff works. Um, like, and I was floored by the fact that there have been papers published in albeit theoretical biology journals, but journals nevertheless, uh, that just kind of ignore that stuff. Um, just, yeah, I'm really excited to talk about it. To remind everyone, we're looking at Dismantled, which is by Answers in Genesis and features some of our favorite uh, AIG names like Nathaniel Jensen. So let's let's just dive into this and look at the waiting time. The evolutionary theory claims that humans evolved from a hypothetical chimp-like ancestor roughly six million years ago. Hey, this is said to have occurred that? through a absolutely hypothetical chimp-like ancestor, um, it, uh, implying what a, a knuckle-walking critter, you know, living six million years ago with a pan-sized brain. I, I don't think so. Most of the Miocene apes were considerably smaller than chimpanzees, and as far as we know, most of them were chronograde arboreal quadrupeds. So they were climbing around on all fours, very, very much like a monkey does. Um, and because of that, there's been a lot of back and forth amongst the paleontological community on whether or not we evolved from something that was an uncle walker, um, or something that was a sensory clamorer, or something that was just a little arboreal quadruped dude, you know? So whether or not it's you know, one of those three, um, it certainly deserves mention if you're going to be overturning all of human evolution. Yes. Rather than going with the chimp ancestor, which is something, and that came about using chimps as an analog has been like a dawn of time thing, but it certainly suggests they haven't looked at this in the past 15 years. Now, can I, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, so I was going to say, am I correct that chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans all have significantly different ways of walking with their forelimbs on the ground that look like they evolved separately? Yeah, the current thinking is that knuckle walking probably evolved twice, um, and that the common ancestor between humans, chimps, and gorillas was a cone-grade, uh, palma-grade quadruped that lived in the trees. And the reason for this is because the way that they bear their weight on their knuckles is actually unique, which suggests that they might have just, it might have just been some kind of homoplasic thing that evolved given the conditions that they were under. Uh, and part of the support for that is the fact that the human thumb is actually a primitive condition. So we maintain the primitive long thumb, whereas they've reduced the thumb <laughs> and length of the rest of the fingers. Mm. So, Interesting. Uh, and then bring attention to clamorers, right? So, okay. Can I also can I also clarify something here that that again this just skips right over both morphologically and as we'll see genetically is that chimps have a lot of derived traits. Mm -hmm. Compared to that most recent common ancestor between Homo oh, yeah. and Congo, um, right yeah, it, it would be it would be basically the 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 African the hominin, right? Yeah, so yeah, pan, yeah, pan, yeah pan, pan, it would be it would, yeah. Yeah. Hominins, yeah. So that like we have obviously have a lot of derived traits. We have a lot of traits that are different and new compared to that common ancestor. What a lot of this type of stuff skips over is it kind of implies without saying that it was really similar to a chimp and then chimps kind of stayed the same but we got really different but the truth is that thing was very different from both and both yeah. humans and chimps have since the divergence gotten very different from that common ancestor they just skip out like right here they just skip right over that and later genetically they do the same thing they just oh, say sure. all the differences are on our side of the our side of the divide yep yeah as I if the chimpanzee yeah, as if the chimpanzee just is the common ancestor, even though we all know you know better. 
Oh so, yeah, I mean that's that's the thing, right? This is this is literally the you know we came from monkeys. Why there still why are there still monkeys? You know, but but utilizing a chimpanzee and not outright saying that is the argument. Um, you, one could make the argument. I heard this the other day in, in one of my classes actually that actually every hominid that is alive today survived because they were anomalous. Um, we have no pronograde, palmograde, or mortal quadruped apes anymore. The only ones that are left are ones that have really unique, specialized locomotion patterns be it knuckle walking on the ground, bipedalism, high speed brachiation in gibbons for hominoids, um, or arboreal clamoring like the, like the orang. So something very strange happened in the late Miocene. It was probably aliens. It was probably, it was probably the ancient aliens. They're always at it. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's get a little bit more creationism. A long series of beneficial mutations. In light of the actual genomic differences. But okay, hold on real quick, though. Not all the changes are going to be beneficial. Some of them are going to be neutral. In fact, I would imagine most, most of them are neutral. Almost all. Right. Almost all of them. So, oh, don't worry. I got, I got references. Okay. Got numbers. It's almost all of them. Right, because right. well, one of the things that it, it clashes with what they're saying now is if you go back and watch our last part, they were talking about how there are all these differences in the non-alignable regions, and one of the reasons that they're not alignable is because uh, they're largely unconstrained regions. Which means that mutations there can't really be harmful most of the time, or beneficial for that really matter. They're just they're just there. Yeah. So just there. yeah, it's it's not even a bait and switch. It's just a blatant lie that most of these have to be beneficial. They don't. Almost none of them have to be beneficial. Between humans and chimps, this is simply not genetically feasible. A more accurate chimp-human DNA similarity estimate of eighty-five percent. We already covered this. That's not more accurate. It's still going to be. Maybe 95 if we're going genome wide, and it's still you know 99 to nine or 98 to 99 for alignable well, sequencers. Come on, guys, it's it's super accurate as long as you're okay with human chromosome 20 being 89 percent similar to human chromosome 20. Well, again, go check out that last one. See part C part one for how mm -hmm. you do math like this. Yeah, it's really bad. It's so bad. Not how you're supposed to do math. This is, yeah. So Two. this number is wrong. We're gonna see. Uh, some people talking about this 85% number. Just see part one. It's uh -huh. wrong. It's bad. We covered it in depth. Represents 300 to 400 million DNA letter differences, an extreme level of genetic discontinuity. This means in order to evolve a chimp like ancestor. I just guess I don't like the use of the word discontinuity there. It's a weird word that doesn't mean anything in this context. It's difference. It's it's a creationist buzzword, though, because oh. if you put discontinuities, it's like, well, this group kind of goes together, but there's a discontinuity, so they can't share a common ancestor. It's a, it's, it's a little dog whistle for the creationists. But we're not going to mention the fact that there is more so-called discontinuity inside their own kinds that they propose. That's not a thing, nope. though. We'll bring it up, Catherine. Okay. Sh we're sorry. not going to mention that, and neither are they. <laughs> Good point. To modern humans, hundreds of millions of beneficial mutations need to arise in an ancestral pop. No, not hundreds of millions of beneficial mutations. It's it's a lot of mutations in general. A lot of differences, we'll say. There's a high degree of divergence between us and chimps since our most recent common ancestor. Not all of those differences are beneficial. Most are not. There are actually papers on this. When they get to specific numbers, I'll cite them and give you the numbers. Plus, it's not I wanna, hundreds of millions of <clears throat> new beneficial mutations. It's just not. That's plus, wrong. like we were saying earlier, they're assuming that all the mutations are just on the human side. We need to account for all of this by just looking at what mutations humans accumulated. When, yeah. if you're looking at two related organisms, it is possible that one of them has more than the other, right? That That's possible. Like, maybe they have a significantly shorter generation time, but it's going to be pretty close to an even split. You're, you're never going to get full genetic stasis, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. Um, I mean, where there's literally no difference since divergence. That's that's like that, fantasy. That would just wouldn't even be divergence at that point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The difficulty with accomplishing this has to do with the extremely long waiting time required for establishing even the smallest set of mutually dependent mutations. Even granting a best-case scenario for evolution by generously assuming human and chimp DNA is 99% identical, the remaining 1% would still be a difference of 30 million DNA letters, an impossible genetic barrier for evolution to traverse in 6 million years. 15 right, million. Let's, 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 let's cause that. Now, 
So first, so let's, before we dive into why this is all BS, let's just take a second to, to can I take just a second to contextualize the waiting time problem? Of course. This is, like, this is not as well known, right? We've got some creationist arguments that are like extremely well known if you're at all familiar with this discussion, right? You've got, you know, irreducible complexity, genetic entropy, you got like the big ones. The waiting classic. time problem, this is a little more inside baseball. This one's a little less well known. So what the waiting time problem is, it's the idea that if you have or some evolutionary change, some speciation event, some new trait, whatever, whatever it is, some change from A to B, if you have a certain number of genetic changes that are required to get you from A to B, whether it's you know a common ancestor to a new species or for a new morphological trait to evolve, whatever it is, if you have too many genetic changes that need to occur within the time frame allotted for that change, then creationists argue that the rate of change to get those changes is too slow, therefore it would take too long, therefore that evolutionary event could not have happened through evolutionary processes. And there's a really important distinction here, because superficially it sounds a lot like irreducible complexity, where, oh, this trait has these whatever it meets these conditions, therefore it couldn't evolve. The difference is that irreducible complexity sets up like a checklist of like conditions that if you meet those conditions in terms of like how the trait works mechanically that you're describing, then it could not have evolved. Waiting time problem doesn't care about that. It's just very baseline, just the number of differences required from the ancestral state. If there's too many differences in not enough time, creationists say, can have evolved. That's the waiting time problem. So what they're saying here is because we have a minimum of 30 million differences from the common ancestor to humans, right? The common ancestor with chimps to humans, there's not enough time in 6 million years, therefore we can't share common ancestry with chimps. That's the argument that they're making. It almost is irreducible complexity, as you said. It's just, it's complexity is a function of time, right? Like that's that's the whole idea. It's like you can't get something this complex given the time allotted. That's that's just very. I you think know. the difference is. I think the difference is. It's independent of complexity. It could just be you can get a string of repeats in your genome in a certain amount of time if they accumulate at you know x number of bases per year, and you only have this many generations. You can't get all those new repeats in whatever amount of time. The complexity is kind of secondary to just the scale of the change that, you, that you're that you imposing. Let's assume that it's still only 1%. That's not correct. No one believes that now. But even if- uh, Just to time out, just so we know, John Sanford. John San genetic entropy and contested bones, John Sanford. Yes. No one believes that anymore. Oh, like who though? Creationists? None of the creationists believe that we're 98, 20% similar to chimps? Um, I mean- Let's just lie then. Yeah, you know what? Um, no creationists believe in genetic entropy anymore. Sorry. Yeah. None of them do. Uh, to be fair, it's actually much closer to say no one believes in genetic entropy than it is to say that no one believes in the 98.8% similarity. That's much more well, right. Yeah. Okay. That was part one, but in part one, Erica actually cited a, a piece on a creationist website saying, no, it is actually 98%. They, mm -hmm. th his own colleagues tore him apart on it. Or Jeffrey Tompkins and Sanford, I'm sure at least he does in Contested Bones. Sanford props up Tompkins. They're, they're kind of the, the triad of the YEC geneticists who kind of um, support each other in this. And that's the part that's so alarming about Tompkins's work because I know for a fact, and I'm sure Dan and Dapper do as well, that Sanford and Jensen, like they they know better too. So you've got times three of people who know better than to compare genomes this way which is why by the way they never compare anything else using those methods other than humans and chimps right they never do the minute because you do it with black bears and brown bears that's it exactly in fact that would be a really fun project for the three of us to do or or have someone do is to run their methods with other organisms Mats, uh, mats, you know, mats and mice, brown bears, black bears. Yeah, black I mean, bears. isn't that mostly downloading a genome and running blast? I, that, that's with our that's within our power. For methods, it is. Yeah, well, that's the thing. That, when you said for his methods, I'm like, that sounds yeah, pretty easy, Tompkins actually. Methods. It's easy. All right. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Maybe that can be a thing we we work on after this series. One percent of the genome different requires thirty million mutations. That's a lot of new information. 
And when we talked about the waiting time, we were saying, well, eight mutations, eight, waiting for eight specific mutations. Okay, so we talk about the specific wait, 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 mutations? Let him, Dapper, let him finish the sentence because you're okay. going to want to hear the punchline. Okay. It takes more time than since the time since the Big Bang. So, no, no. it's not. Okay, so for many, okay. many reasons, which I think Dan is going to be best to go over, I'm going to really, really jam on that X button because, um, no. Okay. Since so the where time since the Big Bang. Yeah, I, I um... Big Bang. Okay, where do we start? All right, let's start. So Erica alluded to this earlier in that there is a number of, of conceptual errors here that if you have a, a passing understanding of how evolution works, you're going to see what the errors are. So error number one, he's implying that you need these mutations in a row, right? Mutation number one right. occurs and then achieves fixation within the population. And within that now population with a new genotype, mutation number two occurs, subsequently achieves fixation, number three. So on, so on down the line, right? It's a it's a serial process. That's not how evolution works, right? If you look at populations, it is a parallel process. Every member of that population is mutating simultaneously. We're all getting different mutations. So if you were to serve not dapper, because you know, just okay. gonna make an analogy. And if you say if you look at my genome and Erica's genome, you're not gonna find the same sets of mutations. You're gonna find different yes. mutations. Whereas I can't make that apples to apples comparison with you because your genome is weird compared to ours. Okay, that's good. Yes, that's probably true. Dinosaur. Okay, so that's that's my point. So, like individuals within a population experience different mutations. So if you need eight mutations, first question is how long does it take to get all those mutations in the same population? The answer is one generation. You get those mutations because everybody in the population is mutating all at once. Second problem, along with that, creationists ignore recombination. Yeah. Which is, yeah. which is how you get a mutation in lineage over here and another mutation in the lineage over here. Well, their kids maybe mate together and then through, everyone remember meiosis, remember crossing over from high school biology? That's how you get mutation number one and mutation number two together in the same genome. The That's thing, how you do that. The thing about this, just as a quick you know, aside here, is like you probably do remember meiosis because you probably learned meiosis in middle school. And what sexual reproduction looks like in middle school, how this yeah. crossing over occurs, why there are some advantages to sexual reproduction over asexual reproduction, uh, and vice versa. So this is this is a pretty basic concept that you learn in biology. And the fact that they missed this, and they're only working with sexually reprodu reproducing organisms here, is absolutely Oh, it, it gets better than that. Oh. Oh. Okay, so yeah, it gets well. Oh, go ahead. So I, one I, of the I things is recently something. there was a a video. Was it which Genesis was it? Dan, help me out here because it wasn't Sanford. It was the other. Well, one. Well, it was, was it? there was the. I'm thinking the paper. Um, okay, but it was Carter had the waiting time problem video that we went over. Right. So apparently, Rob Carter, CMI, Doctor Rob Carter, marine right. biologist, CMI. So Rob apparently Carter now, Carter. despite the fact that this is sort of like a riff on Haldane's dilemma, which is specifically a proposed problem for asexual life and that the waiting time problem really doesn't make sense except in completely asexual lineages and even then it's pretty shaky anyway they then had yeah. the audacity to say that well it just doesn't apply to bacteria they don't have to worry about it and it's just like i'm sorry what no it, you sure you this... can bring down the generation time but if you're going to use your own math it works far better for bacteria than than sexually reproducing organisms it gets, it gets worse than that they're walking a tightrope here though, right? Because on one hand, Stanford, right? He's, he's, in, you know, he specifically is walking this razor edge. Because on one hand, if you focus on bacteria, you get that nice Haldane dilemma, but you also see genetic entropy failing, right? On the other hand, if you use sexually reproducing organisms, you can't use Haldane dilemma in the same way because of recombination, but you can at least allude to the potential that genetic entropy might happen down the line if you work with organisms with long enough generation time even gets worse because this is one of the things and Sanford flashed a screenshot of it. And Erica, you mentioned it earlier. This is one of the things that creationists have to their credit actually published on for real. There are at least two papers that are specifically on waiting time in like actual journals. Now they're not the greatest journals. They're like theoretical modeling journals. They're not great, but they are actual papers in real peer reviewed journals. The problem is this work could not have gotten published in an actual evolutionary biology 
journal where evolutionary biologists are reviewing this work or population geneticists are reviewing this work. There was, is one of them was extremely recent. It was just in 2021. We're recording this in February of 2022. It was published in, I think, the summer of 21. And um, in that paper, they explicitly reject recombination and model a haploid asexual population. Now, the problem with that, as I think Dapper alluded to a few minutes ago, is the point of sexual reproduction is that you get beneficial things together faster, right? You do the recombination, and there are so many costs associated with sexual reproduction that the benefit of, of the recombination and generating new combinations of potentially beneficial mutations or new beneficial alleles together, the benefit of generating those faster must outweigh all of those costs. Otherwise, sexual reproduction wouldn't constantly win when sexual and asexual populations compete with each other. But over and over again, we see sexual reproduction winning. So in the paper, the recent paper on the waiting time problem written by a number of creationists, they say, oh, we don't, recombination is not going to change our math. No, recombination is the reason your math is wrong. And that's the reason sexual reproduction is so beneficial anyway. If recombination didn't change your math, then everything would be asexual because there'd be no point. And consider too that they're running a waiting time problem to, in order to have something to say about the evolution of, of quote unquote macroscopic life, right? So is it not quite strange that they didn't start with, you know, an, a sexually reproducing organism um, in order to make their point, right? It would be quite easy if they're right. They just start with a sexually reproducing organism, they run it, and they show that there is indeed this waiting time problem. Instead, they have to do these uh, very simple organisms that are that are asexual. Yeah. And one has to wonder why that is. I think there's another thing. You are evolution isn't waiting for a pre-specified set of genes to to or or mutations to occur. Is he going to get to that? He well, he just said eight specific mutations, right. and that word specific is a big giant red flag because you know what. You know what we now know about biochemical and genetic functions? There isn't one way to do it. There's a lot of ways to do Ooh, it. Are we going to talk There's about lack operon promoters? Well, like, oh, just for example, what if you were to replace the approximately 100 nucleotide lack operon promoter with a random string of 100 nucleotides? Let's explain. What fraction of those random sequences actually allow you to express those genes? Let's real for quick example, though, say what a lack operon is, because I feel like oh, yeah, most sorry, people don't for, know what yeah. that is. So in bacteria, you have a, a genetic unit called an operon. It's a number of genes plus all together. They're all controlled as a unit by something called a promoter. So you have a promoter is the on-off switch. And then you have a number of genes that are all on or off according to that one switch, that one promoter. So in E. coli, the LAC operon makes the genes for the E. coli, to, or I should say contains the genes for the E. coli to digest lactose, the sugar. So in this experiment, this is uh, from Yona et al. 2018. Uh, what they did, really cool study. They, instead of having this, the you know, what's called the wild type promoter, wild type just means the most common version that you find yeah, in nature. You find a bunch they of E. coli, this is that. what they almost all have. Yeah, this is what they all look like. He said, the heck with that. They replaced, it's about 100 base pairs long. They replaced it with 100 random base pairs a lot of times. And what they found was that just hundred base pairs, just drop random in there. Some fraction, a small fraction, but some fraction showed expression with a single mutation. Each of those 100, those sets of 100 random nucleotides in there with a single mutation, almost all of them showed some level of lack operon expression and some exceeded the level of expression from the wild type promoter. So, so there's not a target. There's a lot of things that'll work. You just have to find one. And one thing yeah, I want to say is yeah. that's that's about 1.6 billion possible base pair combinations, of which what was the percentage that actually recovered operon functionality again? Uh, with no mutations, it was like less than 10 percent, but it was in the it was in the mid to high single digits. With one single mutation to the randomly generated strings, it was virtually all of them. All right. So <clears throat> let's just multiply it by 0.05. Right. Yeah, we're still getting a, a pretty. It was 1.6. Yeah, you're, and it's only 
five, say five percent. Yeah, five percent. Say five percent. Let's be conservative and say five. So yeah. we're still getting like what is eighty million. Uh, it's a, it's a lot. Think about the size of bacterial. Think about the size of bacterial populations, right? They're sampling all these different mutations all at once. If you have that many options to find a functional sequence, you're gonna find one. So, like the specific differences, bringing this back to humans yeah, about 80 and million. chimps and our common ancestor, the specific differences that we have that make us different from chimps, those are not the only things that would accomplish that. They're the ones we found first as we mutated and diverged from our common ancestor. Right. This. This kind of biochemical redundancy is what makes evolution in part possible, right? It's mm -hmm. it's the fact that there is more than one way to skin a cat. And, you know, I, I won't be surprised if creationists eventually have to come around on this and they, they'll do the same thing that they did with redundancy in the genetic code, which is to say, that's not a bug, that's a feature. And they'll say, yeah, I know it looks like it's not designed, but actually it's part of the design. And we'll <laughs> yeah. say, okay, so how mm -hmm. do you distinguish it from evolution again? Tell me how we tell the difference. And yeah. they will say, evolution, stupid. And we'll say, okay, try again next time. So thanks for you cannot change the program of Why are we back to gorillas? Programming. That's a good one. In any amount of time. People ask, well, what's the problem? You're saying there's 100 new mutations per person per generation in a big population. That's billions of mutations every generation. Um, yeah. What's yeah. the problem with getting these the information that codes for something? <laughs> so I want to talk about uh, mutation saturation in a population. Because remember, what one of the things we said was that um, <clears throat> all you need to do is to get all the mutations at all. And they can be any of the mutations you need. They don't need to be a specific eight, right? Now, could you get all eight mutations in a population at one generation? Well, it depends on the size of generation, right? If you have a population like say like the white rhino, yeah, probably not because there's like four of them in the world. Mm -hmm. But humans, now. oh, is it down to two? Okay, well, so- Northern, Northern white rhinos are one. Oh yeah, sorry, I thought you were talking about well, the white rhino. Damn. Yeah, they're one of those one. Rhinoceros. Um, but yeah, so, but humans are in a situation where there's nearly 8 billion of them. That's more than enough to completely saturate every possible point mutation that could physically happen in the human genome each generation. It's something that's going to occur on average. Can you guarantee it? No, because there's always a chance one might get missed. But like statistically speaking, you can be pretty well assured that every generation has every one of them. So how big, well, let's see, how big is a haploid human genome? About 3 billion bases. How many mutations per person per generation? About 100. So that's about 300 million. Uh, sorry, so we have a population of about let's be conservative and say 7 billion although it's well over 7 billion now let's say 7 billion so we have how many mutations just in the current human population single base point mutations that are you know viable they don't kill you right about 700 million well there's only 3 billion base pairs in a haploid human genome so like there's 700 billion mutations existing right now in humanity oh it's almost Likely certain that we missed one yeah very low hmm. So probably what, didn't miss any. what this means is that in populations like that, and remember, to be uh, you know mutation saturated, we would only need a population of about three hundred million people total. So the human population has been met as you know mutation saturated for a very long time, a very long time. And sure, it probably wasn't always mutation saturated, but even if you're at say one hundred fifty million, okay, so you have to wait two generations to get every mutation possible. Oh no! Oh my God! That's long. Imagine having to wait like what, like fifty years or something, maybe on, on like the high end to get every every mutation possible in a genome. There's no way we fair, could solve math, this waiting time problem. To be fair, the math is a little more complicated than that. That's true. Then you have to figure like you have to have recombination, and it has to do with non-random mating. So right. it, it gets a little more complicated than that. Right, but we're we're doing but like, like when you're talking about when you're talking about that. Many, you know, seven hundred, like versus three, like it's a big difference. Yeah, well, we're we're doing some sort of back of the envelope sort of thing, but like, yeah, we're once again we're in a situation where even giving somewhat generous assumptions to creationists, orders of magnitude, multiple orders of magnitude oh. off, many, oh, wait. many. Okay, oh, wait, you just wait till we get to how many differences are actually required in Ooh. the human lineage, just because we have again. There are papers on this, and we're going to see 
just how many orders of magnitude the creationists are off by. Let's well, that sounds interesting. Please tell me you didn't do the math. I did, <laughs> no. I did a little math. I did a, I did a little math. I did, I, as I like to call it, I did physicist math. Like, eh, multiply by 10, it's fine, just whatever. It's, it's fine, it's, yeah. it's fine. Look, I mean, we, can give, we can give that to or, them. Or I maybe like out. cosmologist math. I yeah. guess it's, it's cosmologist Let's math. say pi is 3. Oh, it's bigger pi than that? Three. 10. 10, fine, whatever. Whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it does matter. The difference is that genetic damage is nonspecific. So deleterious mutations can happen in any, anywhere in the genome. There's no, no, that's not true. Anywhere that sequence constrained. Right, which is not the whole genome. Which is not very much of the genome. That's there are lots of places where you basically can't have harmful mutations short of just like gigantic deletion events. In his book, Sanford says that approximately one hundred in his book Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome, Sanford says that approximately one hundred percent of the human genome is functional. Therefore, and he constrains functional and sequence constrained. Put that aside. Okay. Therefore, every possible mutation that could occur because it will occur in a functional region every possible mutation that could occur will be harmful that's what he says in his book that's Whoa. amazingly dumb that is so wrong Whoa. in so many ways i it it's so wrong that i have explained to other biologists what sanford says and until i actually quote the book they refuse to believe that i am not lying about the argument he made so like I- I have to comment on this, and, and this is a little bit mean, and I'm sorry to say that because I know the three of us are mutual friends with people who, who like John Sanford. Um, but I find that, you know, the fact that John Sanford wrote this book, Mystery of the Genome, and similarly that Nathaniel Jensen wrote Replacing Darwin, and that these didn't just make this massive splash uh, and change everything, despite the fact that they sent them to pretty much everybody whose addresses they could get a hold of. Uh, that's not indicative of a bias when people who don't have degrees in the subject can point out what's wrong. Um, that's indicative of someone who doesn't have time to read past the first chapter when everything in the first chapter is incorrect. Yeah. So that's specific. so creating damage is easy, but in the case of a, a manuscript or a, a program or a computer program. All right, we're going to stop on the computer program thing too, because here's one of the big things about computer programs. They're almost entirely constrained. It takes very few typos anywhere in a computer program to make the program not do what you want it to do. There's a very small number of ways to do the thing you want to do. The only time you have areas of a, that are not sequence constrained is when you have those little brackets giving you like notes like, hey, this is the code for this function, which by the way, if you're coding, you should do. It's good practice. So that way, when you go back to your old code, you know what the heck you're talking about. But um, other than those sections, which are usually the minority, most code isn't majority notes, right? Like that would be weird. Yeah, so it's really bad. And also, DNA it has a fairly robust code overall. We have things like synonymous codon, so you can actually have mutations that change the genome in an actual coding sequence, but don't actually change what the coding sequence codes for at all, not even a little bit. Um, yep. There's also like, we have large unconstrained regions. Like we said, we have things like, um, there, there are regions of the genome that basically are just there to like, so the whole thing doesn't just run together into one big long yeah, coding you got, you area. Got, you got a thing here, and you got a thing here, and there's got to be X number in between, but the content of right. the in between doesn't matter. It just has to be within a certain range size. Which, right? That's they, unconstrained. They are obsessed with comparing the natural world to man made things, uh, whether it's comparing different types of organisms to different types of cars or planes or amphibious vehicles or comparing DNA or the genetic code to computer code. Similarities can be drawn, right? Like planes fly and so do birds. And that's about where the similarities stop, right? Imagine using the former to inform the latter, right? Imagine taking something that humans make now and using it to inform your understanding of the entire natural world. When biology is considered by pretty much everybody I've ever come across to be impeccably unintuitive in some places that's that's the beauty of it it's is it's it's wide mutability and it's it's wide flexibility in a sense that as dapper mentioned doesn't appear to be that intentional right unless you just say that everything that is unintentional is actually intentional because you want it to be and that's the only way to misconstrue yeah. this stuff. it gets it get there's some there it's beyond the scope of what we're doing here but there are some 
I don't want to say fringe, but there are some not in the middle of the creationist argument universe, but kind of outer layers of it that are things like uh, they, they call like repetitive sequences in the human genome that are clearly just the remnants of transposons. They call them VIGEs, variation inducing genetic elements, basically saying, sure, they don't have a function now, but they were designed and they will acquire or cause, they will acquire a function or cause an important change later, right? So they're putting a future pre-designed function on a sequence now that does not have a current function. This is directly like, analogous to saying we will figure out a way to break physics to make Noah's floods catastrophic plate tectonics or hydroplate work. So you're not, I mean, you're, you're literally just breaking the concept of biology to make that happen. And there is this is the most important thing here that I think creationists miss all the time is that there is exactly zero precedent to do so. It just doesn't exist. Right. You don't appeal to breaking you know, laws of nature or physics or whatever, chemistry, I don't know. Um, I guess that would be laws of physics too. I guess it all boils down to physics, but you you wouldn't appeal to breaking it all unless there was a precedent to do so. That's that's why physics has changed when and where it has, because we couldn't use the current model to solve um, certain kinds of issues. Um, this is not a problem that is unsolved. This is a problem that precludes a certain worldview. And because of that, you have to find some way to push it down the line. Don't worry, everybody. We're working on it. And that's what they will continue to say about a lot of this stuff until the end of time, until the heat death of the universe. It's easy to break them by changing letters. Really hard to improve them. And you have to wait a really long time for the specific letter to mutate into the specific alternative letter. Did you want? It's not. It doesn't have to be specific. There's no. lots of yeah. ways to do biochemical things. It doesn't have to be specific. Also, you can take random sequence libraries. You can randomly make RNA sequences and get functional ribozymes. You can randomly make polypeptides and get proteins with biochemical activity. It's not. There are not like. There's not one way to make a helicase. One way to make an ATP synthase. One way to do this. One way to do that. There's a lot of ways to do all these things. Uh, Dan, do you you seriously believe that the uh, genetic code can generate an on-off signal and open closed door coding by itself? Yeah. I, I, you're guys, Erica, like, you're raising my blood pressure. I'm raising my own blood pressure. <laughs> the, 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 the issue with this is, though, is that that's how it goes, right? Dan or one of us, and Dan will be the stand-in here, will we'll present this, this type of empirical evidence where it's like, have we randomized these sequences and seen what happens in the lab? Yes, we have. It doesn't matter. That's not good enough. Have we seen it in the wild? Yes, we have. Well, have you considered this completely different thing that is entirely unrelated to what we're talking about now? If someone pivots in a conversation about this kind of stuff, um, that's your immediate alarm bell that should be going off, that it does not matter. The goalposts are on wheels. Okay, slightly off topic here, but um, what is this visual? Because we've got a bunch of letters representing nucleotides forming Wait, both the no, backbone and no. multiple areas of the, the actual base pair. Oh, no! Oh, no! What is this? What am I seeing right now? Wait, oh, that's, no, the that's not how DNA no, works. The H-bonds are... It's new letters across the middle and big letters on the backbones. Oh, no! Yes! No. It's... <laughs> This is this is worse. This is worse than the for no reason gor gorilla. The for no reason gorilla was at least too cute, because you know gorillas are great. But like this is this is complete misunderstanding is, of all of this. I hope. I mean, presumably they know the structure of DNA and they're just sloppy using their graphics because this is like Kent Hovind, the two halves of the chromosome come together <laughs> level. Yeah. Or, or the oh man. Fair, what? Where you got? You oh got man. TV. Good. Big A, big B, little B, little B, little and, A, little yeah, A, yeah, big A. I mean, this is just a mess. Yeah. Hopefully, look, I'll, I'll say this. this. It's, it's entirely. A banana punnet square. It really is. But I'm, I'm going to give a little bit of charity here and say that perhaps Jensen and Sanford were not in charge of, like, the they graphic arts well, team, yeah. right? Like, there, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. some animator who threw this together without consulting them. Yeah, and then I guess mm -hmm. they just didn't watch it before it went to press. Yeah, probably not. Well, Ken Ham watched it, and he doesn't know the difference. Yeah, Ken so. Ham probably can't see well enough. 
know what he's looking at. Yeah, he well, being a werewolf, he's got a keen sense of uh, smell, but his his eyesight's not that great. Shall we specific yes. sight to actually create any type of benefit? So waiting time for beneficials is different from waiting time for neutrals. You don't have to wait long for a neutral or for a deleterious. If the waiter Pause. really he just effed up. Mm. He just messed up. Pause. This is the guy who says that neutrals don't exist. Mm. You know, he's like, oh, it takes a long time to get neutrals. I mean, those, I mean, Beltier, I mean, harmfuls, right? He, the, see what happened there? The mask. Look, I, I've said it many I'm times. They left that in. I've said it many times. I know that younger creationism is never going to be consistent with reality, but I really wish it would be consistent with itself. Please. Please. That, like that, I feel like that's the minute. Like you're doing bad world building, guys. Even like you know, young adult fantasy writers are doing way better at world building than this. And yes, that is a dig at some young adult fantasy writers. I I just I feel like I know we're being very mean, but the thing is, is these guys are adult professionals. They should know better. Um, there they are know. Know. it's look mess up like this. Forget okay, we're gonna get there because we're almost done, and then I, I've got the real punchline here. Because forget knowing better. They should be able to Google this. And like, because this whole thing, this 300 million, but let's say it's 30 million, but like, we know what the number is. You should have Googled it before you made this documentary to make sure just to check. And apparently nobody did that. So we're going to get to it. We're going to get there. But like, forget knowing better. Double check. Just see. If it's out there, before you say it. Really a long time if you're waiting for a specific and beneficial one. Waiting for the right mutations to arise and become established in a pre-human population greatly exceeds evolutionary timescales. Leading evolutionary geneticists acknowledge it is a serious problem for the theory, devastating for the ape-to-man scenario. That's not population true. geneticist That's not Michael true. Lynch confesses in the Journal of Molecular Biology and Evolution. Wait, pause, time out, time out. Confesses, and then, and then, see, what, see the trick they do here? They are citing the first line of the abstract. For people who are not familiar with scientific papers, here's how this works. You start by saying, here is a problem, yep. here's an open question, and then you know what the rest of the paper is? How I answered that question. How you solve it. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah. So you're citing the first line of the abstract where you say, here's a thing people are working on. Real quick. And then... Real what? quick, Dan. The last line of the abstract, taken together, these results illustrates the plausibility of the relatively rapid emergence of specific complex adaptations by conventional population genetics mechanisms and provide insight into the relative incidences of various paths of allelic adaptation in organisms with different populations. That's, hey, that's the quote of what we can read. Pictured here. Hey, creationists. Pictured here on the screen. That's amazing. Cre creationists. Pictured here's here here's a pro tip. Screen. Pro tip. Don't debunk yourself with your on-screen graphics. That's just a quick pro tip. It's happened a lot yeah, of times. Cut it off. Yeah. Just cut this it is, off. This is, this is incredible. This is insane. It's right there on the freaking screen. They didn't even cut it off. That's absurd. They're not even lying well. They're not even lying well. That's the, I didn't even catch that. That is an incredible catch. That I'm just man. saying, right? Like, Because you're right. You said it. And the first thing I thought is, I've read enough scientific papers to know that you're absolutely right. That's how you do it. You tease the folks who are reading it by saying, here's a big issue. Here's our methods for how we might solve it. Here's how we solved it. That's how it works in an abstract. That's, yeah. that's the process. And there the it is. Process. This seems it's like right this is 100% true to, this is 100% true to form. This seems like a big problem. You know what? We figured it out. Turns out it's not like, Stop being terrible at this creation. Right? Like, this is embarrassing. This get, is, I'm embarrassed on your behalf. Get to graduate so level, because this would fail a graduate level, or not graduate, sorry, uh, get yeah. to undergrad level, because this would fail an undergrad <laughs> level, of course. If it's if in an undergrad degree, it's just you, yeah, if in an undergrad degree, you cited this to say that there was no, there was a big waiting time problem in a paper, in like an undergrad degree, you would have, you, you get a, you'd have a conversation with your professor about why it is that you cited a paper 
that directly contradicts your point. Why it is that you have to repass the first line of the abstract. A central problem in the evolutionary theory concerns the mechanisms by which adaptations requiring multiple mutations emerge in natural populations. Lynch's calculations suggest the length of time required for just two specific mutations to become established in a pre-human population is over 200 million years, well beyond the 6 million year time span during which an ape-like creature is said to have evolved into man. Other studies reporting in scientific literature show similar results. So why, if that's his result, if that's the whole result of the paper, why does his abstract end that way? Where he says, oh, this isn't actually a big problem. We've actually figured it out. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to take a stab at this one. I think it's because that's not the result of this paper. Uh, you think maybe that's the result that he got from some naive calculations and that then he went on to show us the real techniques that we should be using? I think that's pro. it seems like this is what would be the mm -hmm. case. But you have to consider these other mechanisms and then actually... Which, by the way, that, that's another thing that comes up a lot of times in scientific papers is you'll, you'll go through, like, this is the naive way you might try to calculate it. And this is the result you get. And this is why this, that doesn't work. So here's the actual more nuanced way that takes more into account, that's more complicated, that does actually solve the problem. Or it could be innocuous. It could be like, here's the way we've been doing this in the past. It turns out right. that here's an innovative new way that actually accounts for this, and here's what we get. And it fits better with the data that we have, right? It, it tends to corroborate more closely, more tightly. And I mean, I mean honestly, I, I just don't even, I don't trust this. After what we I just saw, you, you can't trust this. They're clearly just lying about this paper because they're they're just just ooh this line is they've, useful. They lied about the abstract. They're just lying. They're what, just once lying. you lie about a paper, we can't trust anything else you say about the paper. Yeah. Now and I they might. They did it last time too. They did it with Bruce. I think it was mm -hmm. Bruce. Bruce said it last time too, where they were like, "It's not actually as it, humans and chips aren't actually ninety eight to ninety nine percent similar." And then they're oh, like, yeah. "Turns out you want to do the whole genome, and it's ninety six. And then they were like, "See, right. they agree with us. It's nine. It's eighty five. And it's like, yeah. just flat out lie. You're, yeah, yeah you're, you're really, I mean, I don't know what else to do. If, yeah. if only someone had done a video about creation tricks called Just Lie. Oh man, I wonder if anyone's done that. Guys, if you look up at the top right of this, there might be a card for a video called Creation Tricks Just Lie. Can you imagine if someone pulled this shit, though, in like a, a conventional realm? Like, you would never publish again. Oh yeah, you'd be you'd ostracized completely. Wait, this is ridiculous. This is, I look, I didn't catch that little bit with the abs. I am bored by how blatant and, and like just just completely just just yolo we're just gonna lie about this, it we don't care this is like, the kind of thing that has had phds revoked yeah. people have it's, actually it's really, lost degrees really, really for bad. this kind of thing you can it's face really legal bad. prosecution if you misrepresent someone's work mm -hmm. i mean if they really wanted to the folks who who are you know helming these papers would probably take action um, the standard the standard is really high for that, but it's not impossible theoretically. No. <laughs> Evolutionary geneticists Durrett and Schmidt of Cornell University report in the Annals of Applied Probability that the average waiting time to form a slightly longer DNA sequence of eight specific mutations is on the order of 650 million years. Well, first, how come that isn't the same as uh, Sanford's Stanford, whatever yeah. 20 billion whatever nonsense? A billion. So that's yeah. Little little odd. Also, let's also note specific mutations. These are irrelevant to real life because mm -hmm. you don't need specific things. There's lots of ways to do it. So there's that, that's wrong. In fact, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and predict because I'm, I'm probably going to check this this paper out. And uh, if I do, you know, we can report back in a future episode. But I'm fairly confident that one of the things we're going to see, at least in one of these papers, is someone saying, "Well, you know, if we did these specific mutation waiting times, yeah, that would be a real big problem." But hey, you know what? It doesn't have to be that specific. It could be a whole host of mutations from the space of available mutations that could work. How, how does all of this too play into the fact that they do allow for some level of evolution? You know, like, how does this interpretation of genetics play into the fact that they're cool with some change? So <laughs> the AIG position on this, and I know this because I just the other day read the entirety of the short version of Nathaniel Jensen's <laughs> replacing Darwin. So I know the answer to this question for AIG at least. And I actually know it for This is an AIG, well. this is an AIG uh, production, so. so so according to Jensen, and we know that AIG is like very top-down regimented, nothing gets out unless it's like approved. 
So I'm I'm assuming that the stuff that has Jensen's name on it is representative of the AIG position. I could be wrong there, but that's my Brand. understanding. That's my understanding. So his position is that you don't need new mutations to get new diversity among created kinds. They started off with a lot of built-in diversity through created heterozygosity, which uh, Dapper, that's going to be another installment in this series, isn't it? Uh, yeah, you're hosting. I yeah, think, I think, I think that is that one. one. And and spoiler road, alerts, guys, so, um, it yeah, doesn't work. So we'll we'll cover created heterozygosity. Don't worry. But what Jensen says is that you go from a highly heterozygous state, and then you lose it, and you become more homozygous, and that's how you get your different species species within your created kind. So this kind of stuff isn't a barrier to that, like hyper creationist, or I should say, your creationist hyper evolution. This kind of thing isn't a barrier to that because it just involves the loss of diversity in lineage-specific ways as they diverge from the arc. Era. Spoiler alert: We answer. can check for that kind of genetic change, and um, we'll get there when it's we not get what happens. To created heterozygosity. Not a little bit of foreshadowing. I may have done math. Ooh, that's never that's never good for them. But doesn't that mean that the created kinds, at least in the garden, were? Taking time bombs, right? If they're created heterozygous, and the only way to to diversify is to be going through genetic entropy. Do, do we need the, Do we need the River Song gift now? Because it's spoilers. Damn, sorry. I'm gonna <laughs> shut up about it. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to see that map. I'm, I'm <laughs> We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. Don't worry. We it's coming. We haven't the map line here yet. Let's 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 finish this one because we still haven't gotten. I've been foreshadowing it the whole time. I, okay. I still don't know the actual numbers. But this estimate is incomplete. When accounting for random loss due to a well-established principle known as genetic drift, the actual weight... That's not loss, but okay. ...in time should be a hundredfold... It is. It's loss, but it it's... Is. I think they mean in like a genetic entropy sort of sense. They're, they're, they're conflating with genetic entropy. Yeah. So yeah, it is total loss in like genetic diversity for is a it, population, but like... Hmm... It's a random. It's a random loss of alleles due to chance events. Yeah. Um, they're conflating it with with genetic with entropy. Genetic entropy, which is not yeah. longer, roughly sixty five billion years. Oh. This is four times longer than the reputed age of the universe, assuming a Big Bang singularity thirteen point seven billion years ago. Best all evolution can hope to accomplish in thirteen point seven twenty seven fifty four ish. 65, that's, I mean, we're rounding, but still, I just, every time they do math, it's like, like, guys, like, do Look, the math right. They're within an order. Time. Say it's five times. They're within an order of percent. magnitude. Minor point. So, this is it's one of the few times the right they've number. been within an order of magnitude. Yeah, they got the right number of zeros, at least. Right. So, like, you know what, guys? Good right. job. You weren't off we're by see. a factor of 100 billion this time, so. We're going to see in a minute. We're going to see in a minute where they have, they're off by several zeroes. Okay. okay. How dare you expect the bare minimum? The audacity. <laughs> Prescribed six million year time span is the formation of a tiny DNA sequence, no more than a few genetic letters in length, totally incapable of producing a single new gene. Modern genetics has well, demonstrated well, right that it is. That's an interesting bait and switch they just did, because what they're implying is that each of these these new mutations, these as they say, thirty million. They're implying that they are lumped together to make a bunch of new genes. And a gene is going to be thousands of nucleotides, right? So they're saying these 30 million are lumped together in a bunch of new genes is what they just implied. Um, but that's not the case. It's variation on pre-existing stuff. Right. It's my understanding that almost all the genes that both chimpanzees and, ha and humans have are shared in common. Like they oh, both yeah. have this gene. Yeah. 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 Also, are we looking at bonobos right now? We're looking at bonobos. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm okay with that. And gorillas. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay I with bonobos because and regular. Well, they, they keep saying chimp, but like the same math basically applies to bonobos too. So I'm okay with yeah. it this time. It's fine. I, people conflate people conflate the panins all the time. Like I'm not going to get you know my my Andes and a twist over it, but um, I would I will do that for the gorillas. <laughs> yeah, because we're not talking about gorillas. <laughs> Those are gorillas. Yeah, if you, for this. if you want to have a gorilla human comparison video, go for it. But this is not that yeah, one. I don't care. I, right. I, I, I don't care. Do it. But like this is this is the chimpanzee again. slash we'll we'll say slash bonobo because look they're talking about genus pan. Let's be fair. Close enough. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Over it. Okay. 
But I, I also want to make sure that I was able to visually identify the difference between chimpanzees and bonobos, and I feel happy that yep. I can. So pink lips, long head hair. I couldn't. I oh, couldn't. I'm sorry. Damn, we, okay, we gotta we gotta work with you. One day, one day you'll wake up and you'll be like, "Oh my god, I'm actually really good at differentiating primates," and you'll be like, <laughs> "Feather in my cap," you know? It'll just you happen. Go. You won't even realize it. Then eventually we'll get you up to speed on like you know like vertebrate taxonomy. Ooh. I know I'm bad at I know I'm bad at <laughs> vertebrates. I know I know I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Possible for humans to have evolved from a chimp-like ancestor and via random mutations. It is an unbridgeable genetic gap for yeah. evolution to traverse, even given billions of years. All right, well, that's okay. it for the waiting time no, problem. Not. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. Because yeah, they've been talking. talking. Oh, no, because we've been talking this whole time about, oh, it's 30 million mutations and it's this many mutations. And how do we get all these mutations? It's all this new functional information. There have actually been published studies on how many new beneficial traits there are that no. have been under positive selection since our lineage diverged from the chimp lineage. There have been oh, studies no. on this. I so find this very hard is, to believe, can, Dan. If you have a new beneficial trait, that's going to become more common in a population through positive selection. The individuals with that trait will have more success reproducing than the individuals that lack it. So over time, that trait will be more frequent. That's called positive selection. And you can actually detect that genetically. You can look at sequences and say, okay, this one has been under positive selection. This one has not been under selection. This other one has been under what's called purifying selection, where you're selecting against new variation. So we've got two studies here. One, um, positive selection, relaxation, and acceleration in the evolution of the human and chimp genome. This is uh, Arbiza et al., 2006. And we've got more genes underwent positive selection in chimpanzee evolution than in human evolution. That's Arbiza et al., 2007. We're supposed to be exceptional. We're the ones that change, not yeah, them. They're, they're more at genetic. Well, it's it's a subheading for us. It's a subhead for us. But genetically, chimps are more derived than we are from that most recent common ancestor. That's cool. weird. Fun fact. But here's the numbers for you. So both of these papers only look at about thirteen thousand genes. There's twenty thousand protein coding genes, give or take, in the human genome. So let's be generous and just double their numbers, right? Let's just it's more than that, but let's just be generous and double them. So one study found, they looked at two measures. One was specifically positive selection. They found, hang on, hang on, 108. They found 108. And any selection, they found 469. The other paper, again, a positive selection filter, 154. So yeah, let's take right. that bigger number of about 500. Let's take that biggest number of about 500. Any sequences under selection, about 500. And let's double that and say it's about a thousand, right? So we've got a thousand protein coding genes that have been under selection within the human lineage relative to the chimp lineage, right? Since we diverged from our common ancestor, about a thousand. Now I'm going to do some, what I call cosmologist math here real quick, where orders of magnitude are things that we are not super concerned with. Yeah, we just right? toss them around. We're going to do some cosmologist math here, where pi can equal one, it can equal ten. This is from an XKCD. It's fine. It's, I, it's fine. It can equal one, it can equal ten. It doesn't matter. It's fine. So these, these 1,000 beneficial mutations that we talk about are beneficial alleles. Strictly speaking, it's alleles we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Let's say we missed a bunch. Let's hypothetically, let's say it's 2,000. Let's just say. Let's also say, because we're just looking at protein coding genes, let's also look at regulatory sequences. There are similar studies, but they're not as robust for the chimps and humans when it comes to regulatory sequences, but the numbers are much, much smaller. Uh, somebody mentioned to me um, in talking about this one particular study that had the number in the double digits. So we're oh, talking wow. much, That's much tiny. smaller numbers yeah. when it comes to regulatory sequences, which I mean makes sense because like physiologically humans and chimps are like really darn similar, right? Yeah, in terms so, of like, like, that many, like right? gene regulation, so, I would think so. So let's just say, but let's just, let's call it a thousand. Let's just say it's another thousand for regulatory okay. sequences, right? Okay. Right. So we're okay. several okay. orders of magnitude for regulatory sequences just tossed in. So now, we're up to, so now we're up to 3,000 total. Right? Okay. And now let's let's do one more thing, because again, we're talking about 
alleles, which is a version of a gene. We're not talking about individual mutations. So let's just say, hypothetically, we know this is wrong. We know this is an overestimate. But let's say for every sequence we have identified and all those bonus sequences, we're just saying just in case, let's say instead of one mutation in each of those sequences that makes it new and beneficial, let's say it's 10. Okay. Let's just say, let's just multiply by 10. Fine. Right? You know, what's, a, what's an 10? order of magnitude between friends? It's good. You know, whatever, right? So let's just multiply by 10 and we get 30,000. Okay, 30,000. Hmm. The lowest number, the lowest number, the floor that creationists cite as the number of new beneficial mutations is 30 million. Hmm. So using our bananas estimates, where we're just like, double it, add a thousand, multiply by 10, just whatever, just complete things that are completely unsupported by the evidence, but we're just going to be nice to creationists. If you do that, the number you arrive at, this bonkers overestimate that you arrive at, something that is off by a lot, right? Potentially more than one order of magnitude on the high end. Possibly. That number is still three orders of magnitude below the number that creation has claimed. So, why is it that it like, feels like every single time creationists do math, they're off by at least two orders of magnitude and usually more like three to ten? This is the equivalent to trying, you're at a bar, right? You're throwing darts at the board. You're aiming for the bullseye. You let that dart fly, and it just takes a 90-degree turn, bust out the window, and hits <laughs> a car on the highway, right? You are so far from the mark here that you're, there is simply no way that they're actually using real data sets. That's horrible to say. Can't get that you, result. You cannot be that far off. Look, it's like looking at it. this. It, it's Google, like, they are not using real data sets. They don't care. You could go to yeah, Google yeah. Scholar. You can go to, you know, PubMed. You could just Google stuff. You could say human chimp positive selection. So it, and to you get these papers to, to kind of get at like the order of magnitude thing. It's sort of like looking at like a dachshund and saying, yeah, that probably weighs about 10 tons. That makes sense. Well, I, I yeah. guess, you know, like so eight to 10 tons is a reasonable approximation for how much a dachshund weighs. Why not? Because. <laughs> Because that's ridiculous. How, how how tall how tall is how tall is a teenager? Uh they're about a mile. They're about a mile tall. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> right. maybe maybe a dozen miles. I don't I don't know. Right. They're, that's that's the scale of the error we're talking about here. For those of you who aren't in the US, so, it's about two and a half kilometers. It's so disappointing, honestly. Like it's so disappointing because the response to by the Christians community, um, but the response that they had to legitimate scientists being like, okay, you want to play at the big boy table, do some real work, right? Give us some real numbers, let us know what you think. And their response was, fine, we'll do it. They saw that the numbers didn't work and they went, hmm, well, hmm. What, if we just, what if we just, what if we just lie about it? And, and, and like, I know that's a big accusation, but I don't see what? for the I didn't see it for the Tomkins stuff, and I don't see it here because these are people with professional degrees, guys. They're professionals. They know how to search for papers. They know how to find these answers if yeah, they are looking not, for them. Yeah, they cited. They, cited they lied themselves. about papers that they did cite, so they can find them in the first place. Obviously, it would be very hard. You would have to be selectively filtering these this kind of data out to find some of the papers that they do cite, Maybe. and not at least address these ones because normal scientific procedure when you're going against the grain is you say conventional scientists say this here is why they were wrong and here's you know so and so at all here's why they're wrong here's so and so at all here's why they're wrong and you right. know and it's with mm. they're gonna go boom roasted boom roasted exactly. they have to yeah. hit everybody to yeah. show why the consensus yeah. is wrong and if you're just going yeah. to ignore the studies that answer the question you are asking and pretend they don't exist. You are not serious. You are just, and look, it's, Erica says, you know, this is, you know, it's a big accusation to say they're being dishonest, but what's the alternative that they're dumb? It's hard, it's hard to imagine that people with advanced degrees in, in at least adjacent fields are this dumb. This isn't, this isn't something either where it's like, Oh, well, have you considered that actually the majority is wrong here? This isn't the problem with conclusions that we're disagreeing with here. They're not even using the right data sets. That's the issue. 
So, and data is, some, this is the pre-interpreted hard numbers that you get from, from doing, you know, from sampling this kind of, sampling within genetics, right? They're not using that. Why? You have to ask, why is it that they're not using data sets that have been used time and time and time again? And they're not really saying where the data sets that they are using are coming from. How do they come to these it's, conclusions? I, I don't know. It's a mystery. I think, I think it's, it's a made mystery. Up. I think it's I think it's made up. Honestly, I think that they just generate data that they they like. It wouldn't be the first time someone did that to get the results they wanted. Uh, unfortunately, it wouldn't. It re- it really wouldn't. Um, I, you know, I've given it I've given my damnedest a couple times for a few select things. One that comes to mind is coral growth rates, right? And I've just perused through that literature to the 1900s, you guys, like nice. late 1890s or whatever, to try to find some of this stuff because it's like some random boat captain who like sailed through an area and some dude was like, oh yeah, that coral looks like it's growing at this rate. They get the, you still can't find it. And you almost have to wonder if the reason they cite so into obscurity like that is because they just think no one's going to look. <laughs> and then Army Downer comes in and he's like, oh, <laughs> oh check in. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I think it's probably time that we wrap this up and we look forward to uh, what is our next section, Dan? Because that's on your channel. Oh, so I'm going to host the next one. And I just want to set expectations ahead of time. Um, We've gotten some really nice graphics when we were over at Guts at Gibbon. Um, I'm sure we're going to get some nice graphics here with Dapper Dino. Of course. Uh, I want you all to know that when it's me, it's going to be a Zoom video capture. And that's what you're going to get. And maybe we'll, we'll, you know, we'll share a screen. And like, that's it. So what we're going to talk about next time is the next segment of this uh, this part of Dismantled here, and they are going to talk about the calculations done by Harvard graduate Dr. Nathaniel Jensen uh, that purport to show that mitochondrial Eve, the mitochondrial most recent common ancestor, existed approximately 6,000 years in the past. Oh, 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 we have, so, we're going to have so much fun. Are we going to get to talk about Ann Gibbons? I can't wait. I'm... Which, by the way, is there any relation between Ann Gibbons and Gutsa Gibbon? I, I, I speculated no, 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 last no. time I talked about her, but no relation? Okay. No yeah. relation. There are many Gibbons as okay. who are out and about. Okay, because I, I brought up that paper uh, not that long ago in a video, and I was just like, I wonder if there's any relation. Probably not, but no, I figured no, I'd no, check. No. Okay. Just All another right. half about it. Okay. <laughs> um, well, that sounds like fun, and um, I hope to see all of you there. So uh, if that video has already come up, It'll be linked in the description. If not, well, I can't time travel, so deal with it. Bye, everybody. I just want to take a minute to thank my channel members and patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Bent Hovind, Denny5252, Ian Chen, John Ackerman, Chris Love, Landon Noel, Lingue, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, and Patrick Dennis. The people whose names you see on screen right now are a big part of keeping the lights on here at Casa Dino. And without them, this channel really wouldn't exist in the form that it does now. If you'd like to join this awesome team, there are links down in the description to join the channel or to join my Patreon. It starts at only a dollar on Patreon or $1.99 here on YouTube. There's also a convenient join button right below this video if you want to join as a member on YouTube. Joining lets you see most of my videos early, in some cases more than a month early. Also, you can join an exclusive member and patron-only Discord server, which has a pretty direct line to me. And as you go up in tier, you get more and more benefits, including getting your name on this list. If a monthly subscription isn't really for you, but you still like to help out the channel, there's a merch store linked in the description. It has t-shirts, it has baby onesies, it has mugs, it has blankets, anything you want, Dapper Dino branded. And if none of that seems right for you, please just like and share my videos and subscribe to the channel. That helps immensely. Thank you very much.